What do you want to record it for? I'm recording, but the battery's dying. So look, if you go, so let's talk about the study of political ideas. Let's talk about the study of political ideas and political ideologies at universities. <laughs> Why does it matter? It matters because the university is the natural place where you would expect the serious, scientific, rigorous, careful, analytical study of the relevant ideas about political life. Yes, you can acquire them in different ways. You can just go to the library and read the books that you find interesting or that someone has curated for you or that you read. You Jordan Peterson put them on a list. But a natural place to expect an education and the basics of political ideas and ideologies is at the university, in the Department of Political Science. And specifically in that part of political science where you study the ideas of justice, power, authority, legitimacy, law, constitutions, and so on, namely in political theory. So, but this analysis applies more broadly as well. You know that if you go to a university, you're a first year student at a university, you can find like-minded students, but especially like-minded professors and courses on liberal political thought. So I mean the liberal tradition, broadly conceived of. You know, you'll be reading the authors, you'll be dealing with the issues, You'll be faced with the mindset okay, that accords with the liberal political world. And there are courses that you can take on, on leftist political thought. Sometimes there are entire departments that reflect leftist political ideology. You know you can take a class in a very normal department of political science. You can take a class on Marx, or at least encounter some readings of Marx. Um, on your reading list. That's fine. In fact, that's completely appropriate. The issue is that we know that on one hand you have liberal ideology and, or liberal political theory, let's say, and leftist political theory, both of which are represented in university um, reading lists and, and coursework and professor attitudes. But clearly there's no serious scientific academic analytical study of right-wing anti-liberalism at universities and in my view that is a problem so why is there no study of right-wing anti-liberalism for the most part no serious study of right-wing anti-liberalism in departments of political science well for a variety of reasons probably for foremost among them is the view that history itself has refuted right-wing anti-liberalism. Anybody who is interested or shows a desire to learn about right-wing anti-liberalism... But honey, how come social groups still exist and uh, we study it and okay, so still why, admire it all right, fascism? Fine, so I said fascism or right-wing anti-liberalism has been refuted by history. Nobody wants to teach it because it has no theoretical merit. It can have no theoretical merit. All that you need to know about it is Hitler. End of story. So why isn't that true of the left of liberalism? I mean, criticisms of liberalism from the left. Why isn't that true of Marx? Why isn't that true of the uh, uh, Marxist tradition? Well, because as all of you know, universities tend, tend to be they tend, the humanities and the social sciences tend to be overrepresented by left-leaning faculty. So left-leaning faculty selectively interpret the failure of socialism as it's never having been implemented authentically, for example. Whereas they interpret the historical failure of fascism as refutation of fascism. So like in all of political life, double standards apply in this case. You charitably interpret the historical failure of your own ideological camp, and you maliciously, let's say, interpret the historical failure of your opponent's ideological camp. So if we applied, let's take a very unsophisticated, 
version of the defense of socialist and communist thought, which says, which says, no, communist regimes weren't true communism. Okay, they weren't they weren't real communism. So or I'm taking a very simplified statement. And then they began the talk. So the idea was good. And then yeah, hold on. So you here. separate good. So let's set. So. We're going to separate the idea of communism from its political historical implementation. We're going to say that socialist and communist states were never truly communist and we can continue to derive important moral principles from the uh, from the th theoretical works, okay? And we and see the historical states as poor implementations of those moral principles. Right. Well, Structurally, you can imagine, I mean, we can craft on a structural analogy, the exact same argument. I don't defend this, by the way, I'm just stating it. The same argument from the right. So imagine now that a neo-fascist or neo-Nazi professor said the same thing, just switch the words communism and Nazism. So Nazi principles can still teach us something. They weren't correctly implemented by the regimes that called themselves Nazi regimes or by the regime, regimes that called themselves fascist regimes. Mussolini's Italy wasn't fully true to the ideals and promises of fascism. You see, we're saying the exact same thing, yeah. structurally identical. So what's my point? My point is not that socialist countries <clears throat> were not truly socialist or that we should rehabilitate the study of Nazism on the basis of an analogy with the argument I just gave you, I was answering your question, why is it that some professors can say there's no need to study uh, right-wing anti-liberalism because it's been refuted by history, whereas they don't think the same argument applies to left-wing anti-liberalism. So my response was that it's because there's a sympathy for left-wing anti-liberalism among the professoriate if there were a sympathy for right-wing anti-liberalism, the arguments would be mirrored, it would be flipped. You see, socialism would be re rejected and refuted as a historical failure, and Nazism and fascism would be re rehabilitated as ideologies that weren't fully and properly and authentically implemented. Or there would be a defense of them, you know, there may even be a defense of actual Nazi and fascist regimes, just like some leftist prof professors mount, or a defense of actual socialist and communist regimes. That, however, is not what it I... It sounds very scary to a Russian. Listener. Okay. Very scary. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's what we should do. What I'm saying is that if we care about the study of political ideas, okay, the study of political ideas, and we want to be careful not to, how can I put this? Okay, suppose that we believe very deeply in liberal political morality and in liberal political philosophy. She thinks you're talking to her. Now, in Russia, for example, there is a professor at a university who says, in my hypothetical example, to his class, to his colleagues, John Stuart Mill, Hayek, A Adam Smith, you're going to be reading these liberal authors who came and influenced the destruction of our country in the 90s, and our whole Soviet history was against them, and they have so little in common with what it means to be Russian what it means to love Russia, okay? And they're all a bunch of transgender, homosexual, bearded women. And, the, and you're going to read Mill? You see that? We would say, well, they're depriving themselves of a genuine opportunity to learn from the liberal political tradition. They're conflating what the liberal political tradition may have to offer as a series of texts, ideas, concepts, and so on, with the fact that in the 90s, there was a, what there was in post-Soviet Russia. You see? Right. So, not everybody is willing to distinguish between ideas and their practical implementation. I think it's valuable to distinguish between ideas and their practical implementation. Not to ignore the practical side of ideas, but to at least analyze them in a separate phase or a separate stage. 
So f you can do it in any order. Let's first understand the realities of the Soviet Union, then let's try to understand the realities of Soviet ideology, and then let's try to see to what extent the practice and the theory mapped onto one another. Or you can do it the opposite way. Let's first read a lot of Marx and other Soviet theorists, then let's do an examination of what happened in the Soviet Union, and then let's see to what extent they mapped onto one another. Right, okay, you have at least those three, at least those three elements. If you have any ideas that have had political relevance, you have at least those three components of an analysis. What were the ideas? What was the political reality? And how did those things cohere or not cohere? So in my view, again, we're not talking about, oh, you know, going to reading a, going to some newspaper or to some, you know, click on, on some Facebook post and just reading somebody's cheap political propaganda. We're talking about the serious study of political ideas, at least in a university context. So that's why I mentioned at the university where you expect some type of analysis. So it's completely appropriate that there are courses on liberalism, on liberal thought, on liberal ideas, courses taught from a liberal perspective. We live in a liberal regime and it's totally appropriate to have courses that reflect that. But could you even teach, teach a course on ideology without being an ideologue? You could teach a course on ideology without being an ideologue, but that's not the point. The point is, Why are there not courses at the university that are an introduction to the basic political ideas, concepts, arguments? Except for this one year ideology. I mean. No, the no the ideas. So, for example, an introductory course on ideas and ideologies at the University of Toronto will spend in the course of a semester or two semesters, in the best case scenario, a very short time on Mussolini and Hitler. I'm referring to an actual course. Okay, these were the two um, authors who represented right-wing anti-liberalism in its 20th century ideological context. So Plato was on the reading list. Plato, I would not, uh, you, in one sense, you could call Plato right-wing anti-liberalism, but that's for many reasons an anachronism. I'm talking about a course where you would learn. So let me put it to you this way. As you know, Lola, because we met at university and I talked to you about this many years ago. If you were to ask a student to name three or four or five liberal political thinkers pretty much they could do so more or less okay there's going to be a spectrum some of them are going to be right of liberal you know they're going to be center right center okay center left and so on but they'll get it approximately correct if you ask them to name a handful of leftist thinkers i mean the kind that you actually see on a syllabus and study they'll be able to do that they will have been exposed to a canon of left-leaning thinkers. That's good. I'm not against that. I am not against that. Exposure to a canon of interesting and relevant thinkers is an important part of what the university should be doing. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if you ask them to name a handful of right-wing critics of liberalism, mm -hmm. they are very unlikely, I would imagine, to say, in the best case scenario, maybe I don't know, maybe they would say, maybe they would say Nietzsche, maybe they would say Heidegger, although Nietzsche and Heidegger, as, as Alan Bloom wrote in The Closing of the American Mind, have been subject to a appropriation by the left. So for many university students, Nietzsche and Heidegger are probably better known as figures of the left than figures of the right.